Today, uh, a lot of emphasis has been put on to the gray area rather than the black and white. So people like, uh, like to focus on the gray areas, the colors between black and white, as opposed to understanding that black and white do exist as well. What's really interesting in, uh, <clears throat> when you study Lord Buddha's teachings, it's very clear that the Buddha makes, makes it absolutely clear. It's very clear that he makes it absolutely clear, undeniably clear that there is a difference between correct and incorrect or right and wrong, right? As in the Noble Eightfold Path in the terms he used is Samma, Samma, like Samma Ditti. Now, you could translate that as right view or correct view, right? Like correct concentration or incorrect concentration correct action or incorrect action, right? So Buddha has no, no qualms about uh, saying that there is a difference between a right way and a wrong way. But today we've become so blurred um, out there. And I think, you know, it's not a matter of just now. I think it's been normal that it's always been part of humanity. That's why Buddhism and the Buddhist teachings always are controversial. They've, they've always been controversial. They've always gone against the grain. They've always been attacked and seen as nihilistic or annihilistic or uh, extreme or selfish or these kind of things. And these are always from people and from other practices who look at it um, externally and don't understand deeply what the Buddha is talking. The Buddha is uh, the Lord Buddha is talking about. Now, <clears throat> I. I titled this video confusion right so there is no confusion when you know the difference between right and wrong correct and incorrect this is really important as individuals to understand that there is a difference between right and wrong there is a moral law there are moral laws there is the law of karma now there are religions or practices out there who believe and doctrines out there that believe there's no such thing as repercussion or consequences but this is not the case in Buddhism. This is not the case. Right? The law of karma, for example, or kamma, or if you want to say it in Sanskrit, karma, karma, a bit of an Australian accent there. But fundamentally, right, the law of karma vipaka, right? Action consequence or retribution. Now, there is a good news about this, by the way, is we can escape this simply by following uh, uh, Lord Buddha's teachings. The right view will help you break out of this, the treadmill of karma, of action and, uh, action and consequences. However, they do exist. Now, there should be no confusion to us Buddhists out there. There should be no confusion mentally inside you when you, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, discern the difference between right and wrong, correct and incorrect, appropriate and not appropriate, right? And guess what? When you know how to splice and dice it, you, you will go between black and white and in between because you know when to be appropriate and when not to be appropriate. You know when something's correct and you know when something's not correct. You know when to talk and when not to talk, right? Now, right concentration is pertinent to mental health. Right views are pertinent to mental health. Right action is pertinent to mental health. Right speech is pertinent to mental health. And what else are all these right things pertinent for? For, for social cohesiveness, to live a better life, to live a more peaceful life, to not bother those around you. That's what the right way of living uh, leads to. It actually leads to more cohesive, to less violence, less problems in the community. Because when one abides it the right way mentally, right, and is not confused, one is less apt to be violent or create problems for others or for oneself or create more problems. And the problem already exists, and that's dukkha, right? Dukkha is in effect that we have this issue, this, this condition that we're living in, 
right? That we've uh, subjected ourselves to over and over and over again, right? But the thing is, you know, the important thing to understand is there is no confusion. There is a right and wrong in everything, in 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 all in 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 everything we do in all levels. There is a right and wrong, and that is something that spiritual maturity will lead you to over time or making a lot of mistakes and taking a lot of risk will will eventually show you that right and wrong do exist and the thing is a lot of people who do the wrong thing or do a lot of wrong things tend to always want to do it in secret that's the difference between a buddhist and and most other practices is we do nothing in secret we're transparent. We're always out in the open. We don't have any fear, right? But a lot of these, um, <clears throat> what I would call these uh, doctrines that are fundamentally um, based on wrong view or incorrect views, there is inherent intuition, I think, <clears throat> these people that follow these things have a guilty conscience or they try to do things in secret and in the dark because they know it's inherently wrong. They know it's inherently wrong, right? So there is a there is a complete difference. There is a complete difference, or just a difference. Why I say complete is to, I guess, accentuate the word difference, but it doesn't really need, the word difference doesn't really need complete, right? But there is there is a complete practice, and there is a way There is a way to, sorry, my camera is shaking. Oh, by the way, I hope this camera is better. I've installed a, an app without having to uh, spend uh, money on a new camera and stuff. I had to get a new phone uh, because the old, my old phone um, was very old and it uh, just the camera just wasn't even working anymore. But anyway, I hope this works better. Uh, so... Coming back on to the difference, right? The difference between doing things in the correct and right way is undeniably clear. It's undeniably virtuous, undeniably fruitful for oneself. And when when one starts to abide in the right views, in the right actions, in the right speech, in the right livelihood, in the right uh, intentions or right, uh, uh, that word, that right, Sama Sankapa always eludes me. It's right intentions or right resolve. That's right. When one abides in right resolve, right efforts, right concentration, right focus, these things, these things are undoubtedly um, useful and clear and dispel all confusion about your life path or life direction and anything you want to do. Because one of the things about mental health is having clarity. And all but but understanding, uh, particularly from I guess in this life in 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 the Buddhist uh, in Buddhist teachings, um, is having the clarity and wisdom to discern the difference. And how do we do that through parameters? For example, the world's always been hooked on craving, like you know that the ad from uh, Dunkin' Donuts. We know what you crave. I remember that when I was living in New York. That was there. We know what you crave, right? And there are a lot of doctrines that work off spontaneity and feeling, feeling and desire, feeling and desire. You know, it's just whatever you feel that's correct, follow your desire, follow your heart. I used to prescribe to that, subscribe to that theory for a while. Follow your heart, just do whatever you feel. Uh, but through through various uh, mistakes and, and consequences, I realized that that's not the way to go. And a lot of the ajans, a lot of the, the the big teachers, particularly in this tradition, say it's very dangerous to follow the heart or do what just makes you happy. In fact, it's better to follow dharma, right? And make sure that what you're doing is in line with dharma, is correct or incorrect, right and wrong. And this helps you stabilize your mind. It helps you make your it helps helps you stabilize your makes you steady, right? But it helps us stabilize you, which is mental health is important. You know, I get a lot of family people asking me. <clears throat> I mean, everybody's a family person in a way, but <clears throat> particularly mothers and fathers. But I always ask 
the mothers and fathers out there, where, how is your mental health? Where are you? Are you in the right frame of mind? Right? So when you do uh, impart teachings on your children um, or others in the family, are you imparting the right thing? Are you imparting wisdom? Right? Are you imparting uh, things that uh, are correct? And this is a lesson for all of us. It's not just for mothers and fathers, but it's for all of us. And one thing is mental health comes from understanding the difference between right and wrong, right? particularly in a Buddhist context. Now, if you're, from, if you're not Buddhist and you're listening to this, you must understand I'm talking from a Buddhist context only. I'm not talking from um, all these other philosophies out there right, that are in the world or these doctrines out there because I don't follow them. I follow the Buddhist teaching and that's it. Right? That's, that's where I'm at. Okay? That's where I stand. So, you know, from this viewpoint, um, you know, the Buddha makes it staunchly clear there is a right and wrong, but there's a lot of this social phenomena, <clears throat> and it's not just now. It's, it's been there from the beginning of time where people uh, think feelings are real, desires are real. They're real to some extent, but ultimately they're not real because they, they change. They're changing all the time. And I've talked about this. If one lives through spontaneity and just feeling and just you're, you're, you're being react, you haven't gone deep into the mind to understand that feeling is just an aggregate. There's no point following through with it. Even the thing is to understand that it's just an aggregate. It's just a part of nature, something normal that, need not, that uh, needs not to be clung to. It's not the truth, right? Because remember, we've got, birth experience death right what you do in your time here with your experience is crucial and pertinent for yourself uh, especially at point of death what the work you've done and what you've gained what you've earned is important for your next step uh, now i'm not talking from modern scientific point of view i'm not talking from other doctrines point of view i'm simply talking from Buddha's point of view, from Buddha's teachings point of view, from what I know of Buddha's teachings point of view, right? In the sense of consciousness, in the sense of rebirth or, re, you know, reincarnation is more of a, a Christian thing or whatever. But uh, now a lot of in Western, in the Western world, we have to face the fact that our cultures are based on um, a lot of Western countries. Our cultures are based on on Abrahamic teachings, uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and there's always a, a ongoing debate between going back and forth between the two. Uh, the te you know Western Western countries are based in you know the seven day a week. Uh, for example, in Buddhism, we don't really follow uh, the monks don't. We don't really follow the seven day thing. We follow the uh, the, the the moon. For certain uh, auspicious, uh, for auspicious days, for example, or rest days, there's not really any rest days in Buddhism either. But the calendar is not is not the same. But in Western countries, uh, we follow this uh, this this Christ I don't know. It's a Christian calendar, I guess, right? And uh, on Sunday is the day we rest and things like this. So, as a Buddhist living in Western countries, you, you, there is a base. Of Abrahamic teachings behind now, the Abrahamic teachings, Moses, all those kind of things, they're based in the Old Testament, the Torah, and then you've got the New Testament, the Bible, all these other, and there's Islam, and there's uh, other predominant religions in the West. So as Buddhists, you know, we we when we go into the social side of our um, societies, um, you know, a lot of people are not congruent with I guess the, the, there's no congruence when we say not self, for example, or, or, or um, it's impermanent, or dukkha. A lot of people, oh, dukkha, you know, I've had so many um, ill reactions when you, you talk, people, talk to people about stress and pain. Oh, I don't believe that and all this kind of thing. But, you know, this, this, the first noble truth, even for us Buddhists, the first noble truth, you know, dukkang, dukkang ariyasatjang, right? Um, that in the in the in the setting the wheel of Dharma in, um, in motion, 
the Buddha talks about how that truth needs to be comprehended. So even as Buddhists, even as practitioners, as summoners in this life, we have to comprehend what dukkha is. Now, again, dukkha, um, what, what I believe dukkha is, is stress, because things are st- and stressful. Stressful is painful and suffering in a lot of ways. It's, you don't feel at ease or comfortable, especially, I mean, you just look on, if, you, if you're realistic about death, for example, if you really contemplate on death, you realize that at any time we can go, that the rug can be pulled out under our feet at any time. Now, this is beyond painful, I think. It's stressful. It's stressful because you don't know at what time you're going to be checking out of your one-way ticket, including all your loved ones and everybody around you. I, I, I told a, a friend of mine this teaching quite some time ago, and I likened it uh, to all of us, like if you were to walk on some thin ice with, uh, and held hands with everyone you knew in your life, and every step, you know, the ice can break under it, under anyone and you could get submerged. That's what death is like in a lot of ways. At any time we can go. Uh, to me, the, where the meaning of dukkha comes into that is it's stressful. It's really stressful because anything can be taken away from you at any time. And this is stressful. Right? So that's a, a thing that uh, us Buddhists, we, we need to comprehend is what this meaning of, of, of dukkha is. And when someone is experiencing pleasure in dukkha, the Buddha says that that's dukkha as well because it's impermanent, it doesn't last, and because it can be taken away from you just like that as well. I mean, you look at what happens to very prominent people. They can be up on high on the mountain one day, and the next day they could be in jail, right? It's like that, and it's real. It's happening all around us, right? So things can be taken away from us at any point in time. I see that as stressful. Now, um, because the I guess the old uh, definition of dukkha is suffering. I guess that's suffering, but something that is stressful causes suffering in itself. I believe, whatever you believe, I mean, I, I suppose, but whatever you believe, I think the word stress is more pertinent, is more apt in terms of a, English definition um, to dukkha, right? But even then, you know, um, going back to the theme of of this video, right? When we're talking about confusion, see, to dispel confusion, one has to know parameters. There's no other way. It's kind of like uh, now, I you know, like always, I, I I try to come down to practical situations. It's kind of like any life situation. You have to know what what's going on in a lot of ways to understand how to navigate out of it. Even in a confrontation on the street, you look for the way out, you look for the escape. You've got to be clear about the escape so you can go to safe, you know, to, to, to safe waters, right? To go to, to a safe to go to, to your own safety. So this occurs even like when you're building something or you're trying to clean something or trying to uh, create something with with other people. There needs to be some parameters of direction because the mind likes that. That's how the mind functions better. And he's blasé. Now, when now because there are cultures and there's there's uh, things that go on in life. Uh, for example, drugs, alcohol, um, you know, uh, violent situations, unnecessary situations, tragic situations. All these kind of things, they tend to bowl us over in a lot of ways, and, and it becomes overwhelming. That's why I say, go to you know, try to be as sober as you can, because life is hard as it is, as hard as it is, and you need all your faculties there. Um, now, as opposed to popular opinion, there are actually some people that think that um, you know that monks smoke take drugs and that, that that that's okay in Buddhism. It's not. It's not at all. It's not at all. Drugs, alcohol, or anything that dulls the mind, the Buddha said we need to refrain from as a base. Because it's important to have your faculties there to deal with the everything life throws at you. Right? Now, if you're talking about not being confused, then go to then don't do anything that that would dull the mind or or make you even make you scatter 
right? Or distract your mind even more. A lot of people say, oh, it's relaxing, it's relaxing, it's calming, it's all these kind of things. Well, you know, and then people want to cross the line into medicine. They're two different things. Like if you're experiencing a lot of pain because you've had an accident and you take something that takes away pain, that's completely different um, to, you know, something like of a mental nature of an everyday thing, right, where you're taking a substance in order to avoid the, the situation or to avoid your own self-development, for example. And this area is not as great, right? But in any sense, um, I would advise you, right, like if you want to get to a point where you have no confusion, in fact, wisdom, discernment, clarity, knowledge, vision, seeing, seeing things as they are, which is the total aim of Buddhism, the total aim of the practice is to have total discernment. In order to have total discernment, it, it starts to build on parameters, and that's why the Noble Eightfold Path is named that way, is, is characterized that way. Sama ditti, sama sankapo, right view, right resolve, or correct, or correct view, correct resolve, and there's eight of these factors, right? And they subdivide. This is crucial to understanding there is a difference between right and wrong. Now, if you're confused about that, right, uh, don't worry too much. Just follow, follow one of the ways. Now, one thing one of my first teachers said to me, which was a good teaching at, at the time, but these days I don't even know anymore, but perhaps it's still a good teaching, but I'll share it with you, was even when you're wrong, you follow it all the way to the end because you'll hit the dead end and, you, and then you'll know how to go back, right? Now, I'll say that with some things, but some things are so destructive um, that you may not have a chance to turn around when you hit the dead end. In other words, like if you, uh, you know, uh, like serious drug taking and taking really silly and stupid risks and things like this that really endanger yourself and others. In that situation, I would advise to not do that. But in some things which are more banal, more mundane, you can, you know, you can use that um, teaching to help you. Like, for example, if you're working on a project of some kind or a drawing, for example, uh, you can try to do it, you know, you don't know what you're doing and so, you know, you don't know what you're doing, you go all the way until you really, you start learning. And I guess this is how many uh, great artists, many great builders, uh, many great artisans learnt their way in the beginning by making a lot of mistakes and then eventually you learn. In that sense, it's quite fruitful and positive. But when it comes to de real destructive behaviours, I would not advise to follow that one. Right, not to follow that one. So this video, uh, I'm talk, trying to talk about. You know, there's there's a a lot of confusion. People talk about confusion. Well, understand the society you're living in. For example, like you know, we're on YouTube um, right now, and or BitChute. You know, you you're you're listening this from. I don't know. I don't know what country you're in. I don't know what culture you come from. Right? It's up to you to know your own culture, your own. And if you want to practice Buddhist teachings and you're not in Southeast Asia, and even in Southeast Asia, it's not like um, there are other, there are not other religions here. There are not other ways of life here. Of course there is. And I'm saying here because I'm, I'm here at the moment, not because I'm a resident or a citizen of um, Thailand, right? But I've been living here for a while. But in essence, though, it's knowing the parameters of what's going on inside you and, and, or what's going on with the human apparatus and knowing what's going on in the society around you and the people that you hang around and the people that you associate with, right? And what you share, how you talk, all these kind of things. But understand that moral, morals and virtue, discernment and having clarity is beneficial for yourself and others. And this really does coming, come from and stem from understanding the difference between right and wrong. The difference between right and wrong, having this discernment. Because if you have, for example, wrong concentration or wrong focus, right? Or if your focus is incorrect or your your uh, concentration is incorrect, okay? 
that can lead to a lot of problems for yourself. It can lead to a lot of mental, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a lot of mental obstacles, a lot, a lot of unnecessary mental pain, for example, right? Which is not necessary, but sometimes it's necessary to learn, right? So in this sense, it's not black and white because when you understand what appropriate things, like horses for courses, appropriate behaviors in appropriate situations, but even then we can't we can't cross the line into wrong behavior or wrong action, right? Because behavior is important too, or how we speak, never to cross into harsh, idle gossip speech or false speech, for example. There is absolutely no gray in between on that on that one, for example, on right speech. There's no there's a right way there's a there's a right speech and there's a wrong speech. Okay, now to those uh, who who are new to Buddhism or come from um, you know other walks of life who are hearing this for the first time, this might be a little bit extreme or sound a little bit orthodox. Now, orthodox has got nothing to do with Buddhism. That's a that's a Western term that's given to orthodox uh, Judaism or orthodox Christianity. It has nothing to do with Buddhism, right? It's either you follow the Buddhist teachings or you don't, right? So. I just want to make clear that the Lord Buddha did not play around, right, with all these nuances, right? Now, nuances are important um, when you're doing things, but they're not the rule. They're the exception, okay? And sometimes, of course, we've got to be flexible. I'm not saying to be rigid, okay? Rigidity is not part of Buddhism either. Remember what the Buddha talks about, the the middle path, right? Uh, Especially the, the big teachings about... If the strings are pulled too tight on the guitar, or the strings aren't tight enough, you're not going to get a you know you're not going to get a nice tone, right? If it's too tight, the strings will break. If it's too loose, you know you're you're not going to get a good sound, right? So Buddhism leads that way through knowing the differences of parameters first. So you start to create what I'm talking about is building blocks fundamental. But well, once wisdom, when wisdom has been uh, aroused, right? It, it, you know, the the noble eightfold path and the four noble truths at this point um, no longer have any grounding in your life because you've gone beyond. Hence, the term at the end, the phrase at the end of most discourses in in the teaching is, is the, the the holy life has been lived, done what was had to be done. There is no more returning, right? So the holy life has been lived. In other words, it's been it's done, right? Done what was had to be done. Okay, so you've learned what you've had to learn. Everything's done. Once wisdom is there, once once you're functioning, right, in anatta, and you've reached the goal of nibbana, then then you know at this point, well, I can't tell you what that's like. I can't tell you that I know anything about that. Because that will be making a claim, right? But all I'm getting at is that these teachings serve um, as as a direction, as a per- there's a, there's a purpose here. Now that's one th- last thing I wanted to touch on. Is that you know I want to make it clear that that Buddhist teachings have a have a goal. They have a um, a result. They're looking for a certain end result. Result in the in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, obviously. Right? But there is a goal. There is a goal, and it's the realize it's the realization of cessation of dukkha, which is the goal, right? It's the cessation of stress, where chitta is totally free, is being uh, I guess uh, released, right? Mind is released. Now this is crucial to understand. It's not just a lifestyle or a belief system. It's many things in one, but we have a goal. We have a goal. It's not just to go to, well, it could be to go to heaven if for, for, for lay people or for people who, but it essentially, essentially there's a goal in the Four Noble Truths, and that's cessation of dukkha, right? Particularly the Third Noble Truth, right? So there's a definite, de- definitive goal. It's not just a philosophy. It's not just a, a way of looking at life, right? It's a definite, uh, complete and utter um, uh, 
practice towards, uh, and the goal is freedom, right? Now, sorry, my expressions, when I'm talking to the camera sometimes, my expressions don't come out um, as good. Um, and, you know, myself uh, being not a very uh, eloquent person in general, <laughs> not a very uh, uh, descriptive and very, very, uh, I guess, uh, uh, my presentation skills aren't, Hundred, you know, very good. Okay, so, uh, but in any case, I hope you understand, right? I, I, I don't think you come to my channel to get some kind of entertainment value. I think you want to come here to hear what I've got to share and just to hear the teachings uh, in in the in the in a raw form, right? So that's what I'm uh, trying to teach. But in essence, you know, we talk about our oh, Buddhism is a religion. Well, a lot of people have given the term religion, but religion is worship of a deity, right? Religion is not what Buddhism is. Religion is a practice with an end goal. That's it. We're, we're, you know, we're trying to get out. Done what was had to be done is our aim. The holy life has been lived. Done what was had to be done. There is no returning. 